Welcome, fellow explorers. My name is Christian Alexanderson, and this is Hemlocks to Hellbenders, a podcast highlighting Pennsylvania's parks, forests, and great outdoors. For thousands of years, the land that would become Pennsylvania was dominated by dense, ancient forests that stretch as far as the eye could see. Towering trees such as white oaks, chestnuts, and hemlocks formed a vast green canopy that covered hundreds of miles. The forest floor was often shaded and cool, with a thick layer of leaves, moss, and ferns creating a lush undergrowth. The clear streams and rivers meandered through the woods, nourishing plants and providing habitats. The forests were such an integral part of this landscape that it was named Pennsylvania by King Charles II, Penn in honor of Sir William Penn, and Sylvania from the Latin silva meaning woods, Penn's woods. But as the Commonwealth grew and the United States developed as a nation, those spectacular trees would become one of Pennsylvania's greatest resources. Men bought up land and began harvesting trees at an unprecedented rate. Lumberjacks, known as wood hicks, came from all over the world to clear-cut these magnificent forests. Working in a Pennsylvania lumber camp in the late 1800s was a grueling and demanding experience. They faced long hours and harsh conditions starting before dawn and ending well after sunset. The work was physically exhausting, involving the felling of massive trees with axes and crosscut saws, hauling logs through dense forests, and navigating them down river to sawmills. And after decades of clear-cutting millions of acres of forests, only a few hundred acres of old-growth forests remained by the early 1900s. Pennsylvania's land was devastated. Wildfires spread across the land. Riverbanks were eroded and flooding occurred. Our land effectively destroyed. Something needed to be done. Scientists, conservationists, and state officials created strategies to develop and protect Pennsylvania's forests for future generations. This led to the creation of our state parks and forests. It took the planting of millions of trees, passing legislation, and a combined effort of local, state, and federal governments to bring us to where we are today, a vibrant, thriving Pennsylvania ecosystem. The story of Pennsylvania's natural landscape is one of abundance, exploitation, and then rebirth. And I've never seen that story better told than by the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum. Located in Ulysses, this awesome museum is dedicated to preserving the history and heritage of Pennsylvania's lumber industry. The museum provides an in-depth look at the role the lumber industry played in shaping the Commonwealth, from its communities to its economy. Indoor and outdoor exhibits help visitors understand the importance of Pennsylvania's lumber industry through its evolution from a colony to a worldwide exporter. And the museum doesn't pull any punches. It covers the many mistakes that were made that led to the deforestation of our Commonwealth, while also telling the stories of those that were involved in the removal and rebirth. The Pennsylvania Lumber Museum helped me understand the Commonwealth's complex relationship between industry and the environment. It's a place where history comes alive through hands-on exhibits, live demonstrations, and a deep dive into the lives of the people who worked in one of Pennsylvania's most significant industries. I'm excited to welcome Josh Roth to the podcast. Josh is the site administrator for the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum. Josh, thanks so much for joining the program. Thank you very much for inviting me to take part. I'm looking forward to it. Can you provide an overview of the history and mission of the Pennsylvania Lumber Museum? Yes, absolutely. The museum was... uh opened, well, I shouldn't say that it was opened. The dedication for the museum happened in 1970, and then the grand opening was in 1972. Uh, 2020 was going to be our 50th anniversary year, but as with the rest of the world, we spent most of that year closed to the public because of COVID. Uh, But the museum is uh, owned and administered by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania through the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. We are a governmental agency, just like DCNR, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. And in fact, our exhibits tell a lot of the story of the history of that agency and how DCNR came about. Uh, The Historical Museum Commission came about in the early 20th century when people started to look at uh, old things and the history of Pennsylvania and figure out how to organize and preserve it in a meaningful way. And they decided that the state government had a role in that. So our agency has been around for over 100 years, and uh, we have 24 different historic sites and museums all across the state of Pennsylvania that are administered by the agency. The Lumber Museum was founded in partnership with a group called the Penn York Lumberman's Club, and the Penn York part of that is the northern tier of Pennsylvania and the southern tier of New York. So they were sawmill operators, lumber producers that were operating in that Uh, northern tier of PA, southern tier of New York, and they saw that the industry in the 1960s was starting to change a lot from what it had been like, you know, 50 years prior, and decided that it was a worthwhile endeavor to uh, catalog and interpret that history of the industry and how it has changed over the years. 
So they started to uh, purchase collection objects and uh, look for a place to site a museum. And they got hooked up with our agency, with the Pennsylvania Historical Museum Commission, and received state funding through the legislature to create the Lumber Museum. And uh, then the rest, you know, they put all this stuff in an exhibit and built the building and opened to the public. And here we are. There was a lot of excitement in the late 1960s leading into the 1970s for the bicentennial. So the Pennsylvania state government was very much focused on how can we share Pennsylvania's history with the public at that time. So a lot of the museums in our system actually opened right around the same time, right? You know, just on the cusp of the bicentennial of 1976. There are two main portions of the museum, the inside and outside exhibits. Let's start with the inside. Can you describe what visitors will see inside the museum? Yes, the uh, main exhibit is titled Challenges and Choices in Pennsylvania's Forest. And uh, to break those two parts down, we talk about uh, the choice being whether to cut a tree down or leave a tree standing, and the challenge being balancing those two things. And then we take people through the arc of the history of Pennsylvania's forests and show how those two things have not always been in balance. There have been periods in Pennsylvania's history where the state is mostly forested, we have mostly trees standing, and then there's a period in Pennsylvania's history where most of our trees were cut down. And uh, right now, I'm happy to say in the uh, uh, early 20th century, we have achieved more of an equilibrium, a state of balance between those two things, where we are still very much cutting down trees. We are the number one hardwood lumber producing state in the United States. Uh, but we also have about 60% of the state under forest cover, which is one of the highest, uh, you know, per capita in all, on the East Coast of the United States. So inside in that exhibit with challenges and choices, uh, we talk about human beings and their interaction with the forest over time. Now, obviously, as our name suggests, a lot of that is focused toward the Pennsylvania lumber industry. But we start the, the discussion with Native Americans and how they used and interacted with the forest. Talk about William Penn and the colonization of what would become Pennsylvania by the Quakers and other folks from uh, Europe. And then move through that arc of history, how Pennsylvania becomes one of the leading lumber producing states in the United States. And how, you know, demand just, you know, goes through the roof after the Civil War. And uh, we're cutting down trees like we never have before. And then we get to that uh, you know, somewhat tragic point where we don't really have a forest left to utilize because we have over overutilized it. And then following that, all of the efforts that go into place through uh, scientific study of forestry, through uh, state government efforts to reforest and better manage the uh, forest resources of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and uh, things that help to move that along like the Civilian Conservation Corps and then start uh, end with uh, today and tomorrow's forest section of the exhibit that talks about current forest conditions and what the average person can do to try and help Pennsylvania's forests uh, be as productive and useful as they can be. And we tell that story through objects. Uh, we have uh, in collection uh, over 8,000 different objects, not all of which are on display at any one time, but uh, you know probably about 2,000 different objects on display in the main exhibit gallery. Uh, we do that through interpretive panels where we uh, share stories of the history or those objects or different people that were important in Pennsylvania's forest. Uh, several hands-on exhibits in the uh, main exhibit gallery, uh, uh, exhibits that simulate swinging an ax or using a crosscut saw. We have a section uh, that talks about geared locomotives, uh, where you can turn handles and actually race the locomotives up a hill. We have a section of the exhibit built to look like a log raft that's on a springboard, so you can kind of hop on there and imagine what it might have been like to pilot a log raft down one of the major rivers in, in uh, Pennsylvania. So most folks really enjoy it. You know, it's a broad appeal. Uh, we have exhibits that are designed to, you know, be enjoyed by folks, you know, as young as kindergarten age or potentially preschool age and all the way up to, you know, older folks, everybody gets something different out of the exhibits, but there is definitely something there for everyone. Well, I also want to put this on the record. I visited the museum in July of 2024 after passing it probably half a dozen times, visiting different state parks and going out and exploring different places. And 
I was so annoyed with myself that I didn't go sooner because I just so loved everything that you guys do. It was such an incredible experience of, and I, I won't even address the outside exhibits, which is which are great. I'll just talk about the inside. I was so impressed by the way the stories were told and the fact that the bad parts weren't ignored. The museum doesn't ignore anything. It really covers a wide variety of stories, of experiences, of timelines, and anyone who has the opportunity to go should go. I, I absolutely love the museum. I, I think it's maybe the best one in the state. Well, that's very nice of you to say. I you know, may be biased, but I do. When I talk about the museum to people, I describe it as a world-class museum. I have traveled you know, many different places and been to lots of different museums, you know, the Smithsonian system. And I would put our exhibits up against most museums that I have, have been to anywhere in the world. And, uh, you know, in terms of quality and caliber of, of the uh, exhibit. The museum does an incredible job of humanizing the industry by telling stories of the people behind it. Who are some of the people the museum highlights? Yeah, in the interpretive information we provide in that exhibit, we do very much want to focus on people. Uh, that was a very conscious decision by the exhibit designers. You know, it's, you know, if you're able to empathize with someone or put yourself into someone else's story, it really sort of drives home how history can impact your life as well. If you can think about what someone else's life might have been like. I did mention William Penn. We do have a section on William Penn. He is definitely one of the people we talk about in exhibit. Uh, right, you know, from the name of our state, what he chose to call this place when he arrived here was uh, he initially just wanted to call it Sylvania, which is Latin for forest or woods. But it was the King of England that said you should put Penn in front of it to honor his uh, father, who was also William Penn. He was a junior. Uh, so he decided upon Penn, Sylvania or Penn's Woods. So, you know, from the very beginning of, you know, sort of Europeans moving into this area, we're wrapped up with the uh, people's experience with the forest you know if nobody's if someone in europe has not been here before and william penn decides to call this place pennsylvania they obviously have a sense that when they get here they're going to see woods and they're going to have to con, you know have that forest as a resource but for many of the early colonists contend with it as well because most of those folks were coming from somewhere where they were leading an agricultural lifestyle and the forest can be very much an impediment to planting crops so many of the early colonists that came with William Penn had to uh, sort of move the trees out of the way to make their way in the world as they were used to doing with agriculture. Uh, as we move forward in history, one of the other people we talk about is Cherry Tree Joe. He was a raft pilot. It was his job to uh, take rafts of logs and lumber down the Susquehanna River. He moved to Cherry Tree, which is in Clearfield County, I believe. He was born in Muncie. We actually have, he had a daily log that he kept as he was doing his job, and we have that in exhibit, a section of it, uh, and uh, we talk about him and his experiences as he wrote them down in his log as he was rafting down the uh, Susquehanna River. We talk about Joseph Rothrock, who is known as the uh, father of Pennsylvania forestry. He was hired by the state government uh, in the late 1880s to travel around Pennsylvania and assess the condition of our forests. And at that point, we were dealing with unprecedented demand for our lumber and forest products. And several early conservationists were beginning to sound the alarm like, hey, wait a minute. We don't know what's going to happen when we use trees and lumber this quickly. We've never done it before. So he traveled all around the state of Pennsylvania and made a report about the condition of our forests. And the legislature liked what he had to say so much, they appointed him the first commissioner of forestry for Pennsylvania in 1895, which really led to the creation then of the agency that we know today as DCNR and our state parks and our state forests and all of our other publicly owned forest lands. In that same vein, we talk about Ralph Brock, who was uh, the first African-American forester, we believe, professionally trained in the United States. He was a graduate of the uh, Mount Alto Forestry Academy, which is still there today in uh, Adams County. And uh, it's part of the Penn State system now, but the uh, initially the state government set that academy up because they were tasked with the job of managing Pennsylvania's forests. But at the in the early 1900s, there were not that many people in the United States that were actually trained in that discipline. So they decided if we need to do this, we need to be able to have trained professionals. So we're going to provide that. And uh, he was an African-American gentleman from uh, Chester County that was recruited 
to the Forest Academy by Joseph Rockrock and was part of the first graduating class of, I believe, seven individuals in 1906. He stayed on with the uh, uh, Mount Alto Academy until uh, 1911. Uh, he was the nursery manager there until that time. And then he went off and went back to the Philadelphia area and became an urban forester and was working on um, you know, streetscapes and landscapes, planting trees in urban areas and uh, dealing with people's personal uh, trees on their estate and property. But he has the significance of being the first African-American forester that we know of in the United States. We also talk about Myra Lloyd Dock at that point. She was the first woman to be appointed to a government post in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, she served on the Forestry Commission from 1901 to 1913. And she was also an educator at the Forestry Academy during that period. So she would have actually been giving people like Ralph Brock courses in forestry while those those uh, mostly men were learning how to take care of Pennsylvania's forests. But again, another first that we talk about in, in the state of Pennsylvania, the first woman to be appointed to a public office. She was a trained biologist and uh, had taken college classes in Michigan and was giving lectures about uh, forestry and uh, also uh, how trees help to beautify urban landscapes, very much what Ralph Brock then went into, you know, sort of, you don't have this, don't, most cities at that point were pretty drab and not a lot of color and crowded. And uh, she was someone that was very much promoting the idea of having parks and, you know, large greenways in the middle of the street and that sort of thing. Uh, so she's an interesting person that we talk about in exhibit. And one of the other people I wanted to highlight was a gentleman named Cornell Breeze. He was a CCC enrollee at Camp S87, which is uh, where Ole Bull State Park is today. And he's one of the people that we, uh, during the 1990s, there was an oral history project where uh, the museum spoke with and recorded uh, stories from several uh, men who were CCC enrollees, and he is one of the people whose story we share and exhibit. The lumber industry required much more than men swinging axes. It needed a significant infrastructure of men and women performing a variety of tasks. How does the museum tell the story of these people doing these tasks? Yeah, that's that's one thing, uh, again, with the museum, and you said about, you know, maybe not visiting as as soon as you should have or not realizing everything that was here. We often get the comment from people that, you know, the Lumber Museum is kind of a boring name <laughs> and they don't know what to expect. They're, you know, like they're thinking they're going to be walking through the lumber section of Home Depot or Lowe's looking at two by fours or plywood or that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, we do talk about how those types of places get the products that they are selling, but it is a, a much more holistic story. And that is one thing that people discover that, you know, there's so much more to Pennsylvania's forest products industry than just dimensional lumber. Yeah. You know, we talk about uh, one of the other big pieces that we talk about is the leather tanning industry, which many people don't often associate with forest products. But uh, our state tree, the eastern hemlock, is one where the bark is very rich in tannins. They're a naturally occurring compound. So because uh, we had so many hemlock trees in Pennsylvania, Pe uh, Pennsylvania became the number one leather producing uh, place in the world by about the 1890s. We made more leather than anywhere else in the world. And it was a major part of Pennsylvania's forest products industry that not a whole lot of people know about. So we go into what was involved in that and just the size and scale of that industry. Uh, pulp and paper is the other industry that very much came in. Uh, during the 20th century, as most of our old growth forests were disappearing, the younger forests that were regenerating at that time were, were very suited to pulp and paper production because you didn't need these massive trees to do it. You could make pulp and paper out of much smaller diameter wood. So that was a major part of our uh, lumber products industry. The chemical wood industry was another one that most people don't know a lot about. And with chemical wood, you were using hardwood species like beech and maple. You would harvest, again, smaller diameter uh, trees, probably anywhere from four to six inches diameter at the base of the trunk. And um, <clears throat> those would be cut into four foot billets and loaded into special rail cars and put into giant ovens where they were heated in a low oxygen environment. 
the wood itself became charcoal, which was, you know, sent to uh, furnaces to be used to smelt iron or ground into uh, gunpowder or blasting powder. And the vapors that were collected were turned into methyl alcohol and acetate of lime. And if you wanted those two chemicals around the turn of the 20th century, that is the way that you had to derive them. So the chemical wood industry was a major part of Pennsylvania's forest products industry. Uh, stave mills for making barrels and you know other casks, things that hold liquid, uh, clothespin factories, kindling wood factories, hub and spoke works for making the wheels of wagons, uh, furniture factories, veneer factories for making flooring and finishing parts for cabinetry, uh, box and pallet works. Uh, you know, around in the 19th century and early 20th century, there were no cardboard shipping containers. Everything was shipped in a wooden box or on a wooden pallet. <clears throat> the railroad networks that were involved with transporting all those things around from industry to industry, place to place, and let alone the railroad ties that were required to complete the Transcontinental Railroad, many of which came from Pennsylvania. Uh, the uh, All those factories used steam boilers, so there was a whole subset of people that were manufacturing steam boilers in and around all the forest products industries that were happening, and around all of those places, factory towns sort of springing up, which many of which aren't here anymore. You know, that's one thing that we talk about in exhibit relative to your question that, you know, these, uh, the way the forest products industry operated in Pennsylvania not only had a major impact on the env environment and the ecology of Pennsylvania, but also its economy. Because these boom and bust cycles of the industry, you know, if you've got 2,000 people living in a town all focused around a chemical works, and all of a sudden somebody figures out, hey, I can get acetate of lime by doing this chemical reaction in, in a, you know, in the New York City instead of way out here in the middle of Pennsylvania woods, and the chemical works shuts down, your entire town disappears, yeah. and you've got to move on somewhere else to find your way in the world. So we talk about that too, you know, the you know the multitudes of men and women and families and towns and infrastructure that were all involved in this operation focused on this one natural resource, trees. The men and women in the logging industry lived very hard lives. What was life like inside of logging camp? Yeah, lo logging camp or lumber camp was probably one of the hardest places that you could be involved with in the industry. Logging camps were uh, very, they were small, close-knit communities, and they had to be basically self-sufficient. You couldn't just live in your regular home and walk to work every day because where your work was was usually in the forest, which was by its very nature remote and, you know, not around a whole lot of other people. So you had to build these camps as long as you were involved in cutting down trees, you stayed in the camp. And when you harvested all the trees in a certain geography, the entire camp was disassembled, disassembled and moved on to the next location. But it also had to be self-sufficient while it was in operation because the same, by the same token, if you have a tool that breaks or you need a new tool, you can't just walk out to the hardware store and buy one because there's nothing else around you. So they had to be self-sufficient communities. They were located in the remote and mountainous forests of Pennsylvania, challenging conditions just because of that isolation. Uh, they were lacking in a lot of the modern conveniences of the time. You know, you couldn't go to the library, you couldn't see a movie, you couldn't go out to eat, all the things that, you know, people like to do today. There was, of course, none of that in a logging camp. Uh, and probably more importantly, no doctors or way to receive medical attention. If something happened, they put you on a wagon and shipped you out to where the closest hospital or doctor was, or somebody else in camp tried to take care of you the best that they could. Everything had to come into camp on rail, all the food and things like medicine, and that's those sorts of things were all brought in. So what was there is what was there, and you just you couldn't get anymore. Uh, but the camps were also interesting because they really served as uh, melting pots, just like the rest of America, you know, the massive amount of lumber that was produced was only possible through uh, the massive wave of immigration that we saw around at the turn of the 20th century too. So you might have, you know, men from five, 10 different countries all living shoulder to shoulder right beside each other in a lumber camp. And you sit down at the dining room table, you might not even be able to talk to the person to your right because you don't have a common language. But it was, you know, people were able to sort of share their culture, their language, their traditions, their food ways, all of those things because of the way that these camps worked. You didn't have another choice. 
if you didn't like that guy that you couldn't talk to, you couldn't find somebody else, you, you know, you had to make your way with that person <laughs> and figure out a way to communicate and figure out a way to get along. Uh, most of the camps were also very male dominated. Most of the time it was just men coming into these lumber camps. Uh, the one place you might see women and children is the jobber who was the camp foreman. He's the person that would organize the camp, hire all the workers and set about, you know, harvesting a group of a geography of timber in a place that he had contracted with the owner of that timber to do so over a certain period of time. The jobber usually maintained a separate residence from the rest of the uh, mess, uh, bunkhouse where the other men were kept, and uh, he and his family might live in a separate home. So in the photos that we have where there are women and children in the historic photos, they are most often associated with that person who was the, the camp foreman or the jobber. And uh, they had important roles to play, too. Many of the jobbers employed their wives as either cooks or cook's assistants. Uh, you know, just like we have a, a family business today, if you're running a restaurant and you've got a wife and children, they're all doing something in the restaurant or whatever your family business is, hotel, b, &B. Uh, Same thing with a uh, jobber in the lumber camp. He can be using his kids to collect firewood or sweep up the floor or help out in the kitchen or what have you. And um, while there weren't a whole lot of them compared to, you know, the rest of the men in camp, they were most definitely there, and they were most definitely an important part of the 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 composition of a of a logging camp. In order to get the logs processed, they need to be shipped often down the Susquehanna River. Can you tell us about the process that was involved with that? Yeah, water transportation for uh, logs and timber was uh, the earliest form of transportation that was prevalent in the Pennsylvania lumber industry. And, you know, moving chronologically through time, we, in the exhibit, we really talk about rafting as coming first. I mentioned Cherry Tree Joe earlier as someone who was a raft pilot. <clears throat> the way uh, rafting worked is uh, they were at that point most often after white pine trees. Pennsylvania white pine is the tallest tree in the eastern United States, and it grows very straight. So it was ideally suited for producing things like ships masts and very long beams and other parts of uh, the infrastructure of a ship. But the challenge became, you know, if it's growing up here in the mountains of Pennsylvania and you need to get it to Philadelphia or Baltimore or another port city to turn it into a ship, you've got to transport it from here somehow. And at that point with, you know, <clears throat> really before canal networks were built or before extensive road networks or railroads were built, rafting the uh, the white pine trees down the Susquehanna River or the Delaware River or the Allegheny River was the main way that you got them from place to place. So they would harvest the trees uh, over the winter months from fall into winter, and they would uh, drag them with horses and other animals to uh, a place near the river. They would uh, build the raft usually in the water. They would put the logs or the timbers into the water and then fasten them together into a raft. And then uh, when the springtime hit and the snow melted and the river started to flow again, they would hop on the raft and pilot it down the river. And most of the time, um, there were uh, the pilots uh, in the upper reaches of the river, you know, where the river was smaller, worked on a relay system. So you would have a pilot that would know a very specific section of the river. And he would get on the raft at point A and take it to point B. And then he would hop off and another pilot that knew the river from point B to point C would hop on and he would take it that far and then get off. And it would just relay like that down the river until you got to, you know, maybe Lock Haven or a point slightly south of there on the Susquehanna where the river widened enough where there weren't as many obstacles that they needed to worry about. And then the last pilot would get it on, get on and take it the whole way down to Marietta or Baltimore or Habit de Grace or wherever they were destined to. And rafting persisted like that from you know the late 1700s all the way uh, up until probably the end of the 19th century. Uh, rafting persisted a little bit longer on the Allegheny River, probably into the early 20th century. But that was what that was the methodology that they used. The other way that they could utilize rivers uh, was in log driving. So instead of putting the logs all together into a raft, they would just dump them into the river loose and they would float down the river uh, you know, piece by piece. And that system was reliant upon infrastructure 
lower down in the river, uh, things called booms, log booms. They would build these giant, essentially, nets in the river. When the logs floated into the boom, they couldn't float back out. And then they would stockpile behind the edge of the boom, and people would go out and on the logs and you know, sort them and get them to where they needed to go. The largest log boom that we had in Pennsylvania was the one at uh, Williamsport on the Susquehanna River. But uh, in exhibit we talk about, I believe there were seven other log booms, uh, all of which were all along the west branch of the Susquehanna that operated during the mid, uh, mid 19th century. Uh, the Susquehanna boom at Williamsport operated from the 1850s until 1909. That was the last year that they used the boom. Uh, but very much the same uh, seasonally dependent upon high water to make that type of transportation work. So they would work through the fall and the winter months to cut down all the trees and stockpile them next to the rivers that they were using for driving. Uh, when the snow melted and uh, the river cleared of ice in the early spring, they would dump the logs into the water and they would float down, you know, in this case towards Williamsport or one of the other log booms. But it wasn't a passive process. The men that were harvesting and driving the logs followed along behind the floating logs in a flotilla of small flat bottom boats called arcs. They wouldn't just kick the logs into the river and say, see you later. Hope we make, hope you make it to Williamsport. <laughs> uh, it was a very active process. They would follow them the whole way down the river because if they got hung up, if they washed out of the river, they'd have to hop out of the arc, push them back into the current. If they got laced together and formed a log jam, they would have to break up the jam and get things moving again. And there were <clears throat> other positions down the river where there were other log piles staged, ready to be put into the river to drive. When the arcs pulled up to those places, they would hop out and dump all those logs into the river, too. And driving was also dependent upon another type of in infrastructure called splash dams, where they would dam up the tributaries of the rivers they were using to drive the logs, impound the water behind the dam, and then as the drive was going by that tributary, they would throw open a gate on the dam and let all the water out and inject more water into the stream to help rise you know, the logs off the bottom of the, 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 the waterway and get them moving down the stream to where they were destined to go. So I tell people, you know, as we're talking, giving tours and going through the exhibits, you know, the waterways in Pennsylvania were essentially like what our highways are today. And the river drivers were essentially the PennDOT crews of that time period. It was their job to make sure that the waterways were suitable for transporting logs and that was really all they were concerned about. When you look at some of the pictures of these waterways that are familiar to us now, if we visit state parks or state forests and other places in Pennsylvania, they're almost unrecognizable because of the modification that the river drivers would have done to the banks of the stream or the stream channel itself to make sure that the logs that were being driven down the, the river were getting to where they were going. That's exactly how I felt. I mean, I saw the photos that you have you can't even see the river of the river like you can't even see the water in the susquehanna all you can see are logs for what seems like miles the absolute danger that must have been involved to try to get on a raft made of logs and then go with other logs doesn't even make sense to me it's so dangerous and scary looking right there was really no other way to transport them to where they needed to go if you tried to load those logs onto a wagon it would have taken you forever and, you know, it would have been darn near impossible to get to where you needed to go. Yeah. So, you know, that was that was the option option presented to the lumbermen and they decided to take advantage of it. Yeah, I don't even like driving in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's another interesting factoid we talk about with the rafts. Um, hardwoods are less buoyant than softwoods, than conifers. So no matter what type of trees you were rafting, you always needed a certain amount of white pine in your raft to make it buoyant enough that you would ride up out of the water. If you tried to build a raft entirely of oak, you would probably be in, you know, calf or knee deep water the entire time you were on the raft, just because the oak's not as buoyant and it's riding lower in the water. All practical information we can still use today. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. The museum features a number of interactive and hands-on exhibits. What are some of the most popular ones visitors seem to enjoy the most? 
We uh, generally see folks, and now we're moving to the exterior exhibits. I may be getting a little ahead of myself. I think our Shea locomotive is probably our most popular interactive exhibit. That is part of the exterior exhibits, but we do allow folks to climb up inside of the cab of the Shea locomotive, look at the controls for the locomotive and how it would have worked with the firebox and the coal and that sort of thing. And one thing that I can hear from my office because it's very loud is the bell on the Shea locomotive. On you know days where we have a lot of people in the museum, that bell will ring nonstop. I'll be sitting here at my desk and I can just hear the ding, ding, ding. So I know folks really enjoy uh, being able to do that and you know again sort of put themselves in the place of a logging locomotive engineer and think about what it was like to have to drive this train from place to place. And you know the bell lets people know that you're there, <laughs> so they enjoy ringing it. It's a very popular interactive exhibit. Yeah, and I think it's one of those things where you just feel like a kid again. You're like, oh, man, it, it, you know, I remember going to visit locomotives with my grandfather, and I remember that cool experience. Of course, when I visited the place, I, I had to ring the bell. I had to. You know, visitors are encouraged to take a more hands-on approach to explore some of the exhibits, like this Shea locomotive. Why do you think it's important for visitors to become more active in learning about history? As a historian by training, that's one of the questions we ask ourselves, you know, when I'm sitting in my college classes, learning about history, you know, that's why do we, why do we care about this? Why does it matter? And, you know, it usually comes back to history is most beneficial and most impactful when it can help us understand our own lives and allow us to make better choices about the actions we're taking now. You know, in the absence of history, we have no precedent or way to understand our world. You know, we're dealing with everything for the first time if we don't understand history. If we do understand history, we have that knowledge base and we can say, okay, well, they tried this in the past and it didn't work very well, or they tried this in the past and it was really great. So, you know, that understanding of history allows us in the modern day to make better informed decisions and hopefully make our lives better and the world a better place for everybody because of that knowledge. So that's really why, you know, why we're here and why we're encouraging people to come through the museum and our exhibits. It's it's fun, but it is also educational. And, uh, you know, hopefully it can it can give us uh, give a long lasting impact to the folks that come through the door. Are there any stats about Pennsylvania's lumber industry that just blow you away? Yeah, I'm going to go back here to the one image that you mentioned of the Williamsport boom where you can't even see the Susquehanna River. It's just all logs. Uh, in peak years of the boom's operation, uh, in a single year, there were some years where nearly 2 million logs came into the boom. And that just blows me away. You know, when you think about how many people there were in Pennsylvania at that time, <laughs> and all of those logs having been harvested by hand, been taken to the river by hand or by animal power, and then driven for, in some cases, hundreds of miles down the river, to have 2 million logs coming into one place in like the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, that just, it's, you know, it's hard to wrap your head around the amount of effort that went into that. And just, you know, as, as we were sort of discussing before, people's ingenuity and like who thought like, oh yeah, this will work. You know, <laughs> you just build a big net in the river and we'll just start dumping all the logs in the water. Of course, they'll get to where they need to go. And that was just one year. It's not like they only operated for one year. The fact that that just happened over and over and over again for however many years is just... It was about, about 60 total years that the boom operated in Williamsport. Wow, that's incredible. And then by 1909, we start... The lumbermen began to exhaust the uh, forest resources that were growing near the waterways that were suitable for water transportation. So you really see a pivot away from driving to logging railroads and sort of a decentralization of the production process. So when they were driving, most of the mills were located there in Williamsport. By the 1880s, I think there were 30 different sawmills in the city of Williamsport. But, you know, that you're all, you're funneling all of your product into one place, that makes sense. But if you've got to build a logging railroad, it no longer makes sense to take all of your logs to Williamsport by rail when you can just build a mill up here farther north into the mountains of Pennsylvania, and then you have less distance to transport by rail. So we see a decentralization of the production process, 
mills and mill towns sort of popping up all over the place in uh, the northern counties of PA, where we have a lot of our state parks and state forests now. Uh, and that is a very direct consequence of how we got our state parks and state forests. You know, the state government began to purchase a lot of that cutover timberland uh, in an effort to manage it, to prevent fire uh, and reforest Pennsylvania. And um, if it were not for the lumber industry, uh, we wouldn't have nearly the uh, public uh, forest infrastructure that we have today. And now let's hear from our sponsors. Are you a day hiker interested in backpacking but need help figuring out where to begin? Join the Keystone Trails Association at either of their fall slack packs. Participants are shuttled to and from the trail carrying ample water and packed lunches. The heavy stuff remains at the campground or hotel. They'll be hiking the Loyal Sock Trail September 13th to the 15th and the Laurel Highlands Hiking Trail October 4th to the 6th. Visit kta-hike.org to learn more. Are you looking for your next adventure? Unlock some of the best landscapes in Pennsylvania with the incredibly detailed, highly curated waterproof trail maps from the folks at Purple Lizard. They create extraordinary maps of Pennsylvania State Forest for people who love to explore the outdoors. Find them at your local outfitters, bike shops, and bookstores, or visit purplelizard.com where your next adventure begins. Hey, podcast explorers. Did you know Pennsylvania State Parks and Forests are the heartbeat of our Commonwealth? They're not just natural wonders. They're vital for our well-being and local economies. That's where the Pennsylvania Parks and Forests Foundation steps in. They rally volunteers, raise funds, and advocate for these precious lands. Join the movement to preserve and enjoy our outdoor treasures. Learn more at paparksandforest.org. Let's keep Pennsylvania untamed and beautiful together. All right, back to the show. The story of the logging industry in Pennsylvania inevitably ends with the deforestation of the Commonwealth in the late 1800s, early 1900s. How does the museum tell the story of the work that needed to be done to reforest Pennsylvania? See, that was a perfect segue, and I didn't even know it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, uh, you know, as I was just talking about, we, we, uh, the uh, state government has a major role to play in uh, how Pennsylvania was reforested and how our lumber industry was reinvigorated and re-energized after the uh, expansive clear cutting that happened around the turn of the 20th century. And, you know, I, I try and take it easy on, you know, the people in history, our, our ancestors, because nobody had ever really harvested trees at that scale or speed before. So nobody really knew what would happen after, you know, all that was done. There were just a a small group of people that were beginning to come become concerned around the end of the 19th century be, just because of the scale that was happening you know you look out your window one day and you have the whole forest behind your house and then two weeks later there's nothing left that was probably pretty jarring for some people and uh, again something that uh, folks didn't really have experience with on that scale so uh you know but it, they were they were doing important work because they were it was the demand for the the wood products that was driving that type of uh, approach to logging. Uh, you know we were seeing westward expansion after the Civil War. You know we have people moving across the country, and I mentioned immigration before. Between in, in about a forty year period, um, you know between the eighteen eighties and the nineteen twenties. There were almost 30 million people that immigrated to uh, the United States during that period. And all those folks need houses and furniture, and, you know. So there was unprecedented demand for Pennsylvania lumber products. And uh, the, the timber owners decided they were going to use every single last tree. Yeah. And in many instances, they did. But that created a whole bunch of problems. Um, as I mentioned, the eco economic problem. If it was your job to cut down trees or work in a sawmill or work at a tannery, and suddenly there's no natural resources left, you have no way to support your family. You've got to figure out something else to do. Many of the owner operators of these sawmills just picked up their whole operation. You know, they closed their mill down here in northern Pennsylvania. They bought new timberland somewhere else in Michigan, Wisconsin, Louisiana, Mississippi, and they moved their entire operation there. And some of the workers, if you were willing to move that far, probably could have found work that way. But, you know, if you've got roots, you own land here, you've got family here, you're probably hesitant to move that far away. So it was definitely a problem that needed solving. 
uh, and people started to see all these negative consequences happening, these out of control wildfires, uh, loss of animal habitat and overhunting of uh, our wild game. Uh, we lost most of our major uh, m large mammal species in Pennsylvania at that point. The elk uh, were uh, became uh, functionally extinct here, wolves, mountain lions, those types of things. Uh, you know, the fish and river quality was really suffering because of all that work that they were doing to streamline the waterways to make them better for transporting logs was not great for the animals and plants that depended upon those ecosystems for their survival. Uh, so there were all these problems. And as I mentioned Joseph Rothrock before, the state government began to study what the, the situation was and then appointed him to sort of manage it and turn it around and make sure that we solved all those ecological and economic problems that we were having in Pennsylvania. So we talk about in exhibit all those early conservationists that uh, started to look at the natural world and say, wait a minute, people can really have an impact. You know, the world seems large and immutable. It is what it is, but we as human beings can have a real major impact on the natural world. And what should we do about it? How can we have less of an impact? How can we restore that damage that we did. The state government begins to purchase cut over timber land so that they can manage it for fire and also reforest it. They, I mentioned Ralph Brock as the manager of the nursery at Mount Alto. Some of the early efforts were very much focused at replanting trees so they would go grow seedlings in the nursery and then they would go out to these cut over plots of uh, Timberlands and just start replanting seedlings to help the forest to grow back, you know, for all the animals and plants and the, the natural features, but also eventually to one day cut down and serve as uh, lumber products for, for the people. The federal government became very concerned with deforestation around that point in time in the early 20th century as a national security issue, you know, because wood products were a major part of the apparatus of uh, America's ability to wage war or defend itself, and they they saw all of our forest resources being depleted as a national security issue. So that's you know some of the, the impetus of the National Forest Service and the federal government's efforts at reforestation were very much focused on you know helping to protect the nation and be able to make sure we could defend ourselves or defend our allies as we need it. So we talk about all of that in exhibit. Um, you know, sort of the birth of scientific forest management methods, the creation of the Mount Alto Academy. Uh, we talk about Carl Schenk, who was a German trained forester and opened the first forestry school, or excuse me, the second forestry school after Yale Forestry School in the United States at the uh, Biltmore Academy in the Carolinas. Um, and, you know, sort of that arc of correcting the overutilization curve that we had, you know, that's all part of the story of reforesting Pennsylvania and making sure that, uh, you know, as I mentioned now, we're about 60% forest covered. Uh, we have more than 2 million acres of publicly owned forest land in the state of Pennsylvania. We have, you know, hundreds of state parks, uh, hundreds of thousands of acres of state forest land, state game land. We have the Allegheny National Forest. So all of those things are byproducts of how the state government had, had to step in and sort of correct course with the overutilization of forest resources in the in the in Pennsylvania. The Civilian Conservation Corps played a major role in growing our forest back. What can visitors learn about their work? We have a large section of our exhibit focused on the Civilian Conservation Corps, and we also have uh, one of our outdoor exhibits, the Civilian Conservation Corps cabin, that talks about that program. Um, in terms of the history of the museum, when the museum was open to the public in 1972, our gallery was split into two halves. There was one half that was called the Lumberman's Gallery, that was all lumber history, and then the other half was exclusively focused on the CCC, the history of the Civilian Conservation Corps in Pennsylvania. We have paired that back. It's, it's actually not as robust as it was in 1972, but still a major part of the exhibit and quite informative. So I mentioned uh, Cornell Breeze is one of the specific uh, CCC stories that we talk about, but it's an, it's an amazing program. Uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, was developed under the Franklin Roosevelt administration in response to the uh, Great Depression that was gripping the nation at that point in time. 
And uh, through the Works Progress Administration, Roosevelt essentially decided if uh, public companies are too scared or not in a financial position to be able to hire people and put them to work, the government will step in and create jobs for people. So the CCC was very much a jobs program. Uh, they would pay you to enlist in the CCC. It was organized under the Army of the United States. So you had Army officers overseeing life inside of the CCC camp. You would wake up uh, with revelry, go to sleep with taps. You would uh, drill and march and stand in formation uh, while you were in the barracks. You had to you know, make your bunk, uh, make your bed like you would if you were in the Army, You know the, the popular colloquialism that you could bounce a quarter off of your sheets when they're tucked in. It's all very much a part of the CCC lifestyle. But then uh, after the, the, the morning roll call, roll call, you were turned over to uh, Pennsylvania forest professionals, people that would have been working, you know, trained at the Mount Alto Academy and working in the uh, Bureau of Forestry. So they would go out and they would do all sorts of uh, forest management projects. You might be replanting trees. You might be working to combat forest fires. Uh, connecting uh, rural infrastructure was a, another big focus. They were building roads and bridges, laying telegraph lines, so people in these remote parts of Pennsylvania could be connected. And you know, heaven forbid you need a doctor, you you know, you're not by yourself. You can pick up the telephone or the telegram and get in touch with somebody. You can get on a road and get to where you need to go quickly. And they were also very much tackling the question that the government, the state government was facing at that point in time. They began to purchase these cut over timberlands. So they were publicly owned. They were faced with the dilemma of, okay, this land belongs to all Pennsylvanians. How do we get people in Pennsylvania to make the most amount of use of this land? So the CCC starts to create state parks, build all the infrastructure that's involved with that, you know, picnic pavilions, hiking trails dams to create ponds and other places to swim, beaches, um, cabins like our CCC cabin that you can rent and stay in while you're visiting a state park. So those are all things that the CCC was doing. And many of those uh, projects that they were able to accomplish between 1933 and 1941 are still present in Pennsylvania today. We are still benefiting that from them, you know, 90 years later after the program ended incredibly impactful. One of the things that people say to me all the time as I'm giving tours of the exhibit is, I don't understand why we don't still do this today. Yeah. That's, you know, according to the polling data that we have, the Civilian Conservation Corps is the most popular government program ever created in terms of public perception of it. Yeah, the amount of work done by these men are through the roof. I mean, it can't be overstated their impact let's just say on the Commonwealth alone, not, not including the United States throughout, you can't go to a state park that hasn't been touched by it in some way. I mean, they were called Roosevelt's tree army. The amount of trees they planted rebuilt Pennsylvania force. It's, it's the only way you can say it. Three billion trees nationwide were planted by the CCC. I did the math at that time. That was enough for 37 trees per person in the United States. After you've gone through the exhibits inside, there are a lot of exhibits to see on the outside of the museum. What will people see if they explore the outside portion? Yeah, we, uh, you know, our outdoor exhibits are quite expansive. You could even say they're the majority of our exhibits. Uh, the museum itself is spread over about a 10 acre campus. Um, and we have 19 different buildings uh, scattered across that campus. So, yes, we have 19 buildings uh, spread across about a 10 acre campus. Um, the first thing that folks will see if they are following their visitor guide after they exit the interior exhibits in the visitor center is our recreated logging camp. And again, that gives you a sense of what life was like for someone living in a logging camp in Pennsylvania around the turn of the 20th century. It is also the place where we house our Shea locomotive. So you can climb up inside, see the controls, ring the bell, you know, just as you would children of all ages. Enjoy that. Uh, and we also have another unique feature in the logging camp, and that is our Barnhart log loader. So the Barnhart was a machine that was uh, uh, designed to load logs onto rail cars. And to the museum's knowledge, the Barnhart in our exhibit is the only restored Barnhart log loader anywhere in the world. 
Okay, that is something that is quite unique to us. Uh, nowhere else that you can go to see one of these types of machinery in a restored condition. Uh, we also, from time to time, have special events uh, where we have uh, folks doing trade demonstrations in the lumber camp. We will have a blacksmith in the blacksmith shop actually working with metal and interpreting what the life of a lumber camp blacksmith would have been like. We can have folks uh, filing saws just like the saw filer would have in the lumber camp. And then one of my favorite parts is we have a group of volunteers that uh, interpret the cook and cookie, and we'll use the cook stove in the camp kitchen to actually cook historic recipes. And I don't know what it is about the oven in the lumber camp kitchen. It makes the some of the best food I have ever tasted in my life. Like the biscuits that come out of that oven are just incredible. And uh, if you don't have to take my word for it. They told me we went through 72 pounds of flour at this last year's Bark Peelers Festival with the number of biscuits that they ended up making, just nonstop. Uh, from the lumber camp, you will go down uh, a hill to the valley bottom, and we have a uh, recreated uh, turn about mid 19th century circular sawmill. It is also a functional exhibit. We run that mill three times a year. Uh, April, July, and October, that coincides with some of our larger special events. Associated with the mill is a mill pond where most mills would store logs before they were sawing them. Uh, also on the lower campus down there, we have our birch still exhibit, which I will talk about a little bit later. Uh, from there, you loop back up to the CCC cabin, which is a cabin that was constructed by the Civilian Conservation Corps in southeastern Potter County. It was initially supposed to be part of a state park called Black Forest State Park. And for those of you that know your state parks, you will realize that that park does not exist. It never came into existence. Uh, the program ended when the United States entered World War II. And the enrollees at that camp built the infrastructure for the park, but they didn't build enough of it to actually open the park. So the cabins were uh, located on what is today Susquehannock State Forest and they turned them into long-term hunting leases. And in the 1990s, the leaseholder decided to step away from their lease, and they were going to demolish the cabin. And, uh, so the museum stepped in, raised a group of volunteers and former CCC enrollees that fundraised to have the cabin dismantled and rebuilt at the museum. And today we use them as an exhibit to talk about the type of architecture that the CCC would have been building at that point. Uh, you know, this sort of rustic uh, log built, you know, state park style architecture and talk about the different projects and things that they were doing. And then uh, we have a building that houses our Brookville locomotive, which is a small diesel engine. It was used out of tannery in Elk County. And we use that exhibit space to talk about the leather tanning industry in the United States. And it also houses one of our newest exhibits, the Eastern Loggers Model Railroad exhibit that came online here at the museum in uh, early 2022. It is a 10 by 20 foot HO scale model train layout that is specifically built to uh, demonstrate the uh, Pennsylvania lumber and forest products industry around 1920. So everything that we talk about in our exhibits elsewhere on the site exists in miniature in that layout. And it's a great place to kind of summarize your visit and test your knowledge, if you will, you know, like you learned about driving logs by water in different parts of the exhibit. Can you find that in the model train layout? The, that layout is also functional. We demonstrate it during those major special events and run the trains. And then from there, you can go up to the Bob and Dottie Weber cabin, which is the last exhibit on the self-guided tour schedule. Uh, and I believe we're going to talk about that a little bit later, too. What kind of learning experience do the outdoor exhibits offer that might not be achieved only by visiting the inside of the museum? Well, I think especially with exhibits like the, the Lumber Camp, it allows you to, again, sort of put yourself into history. You don't necessarily just have to imagine what life was like for someone in the past. You can actually be in the space and you can see you know, what living conditions would have been like for someone in a Lumber Camp. Uh, and especially when we're able to do demonstrations, you can taste the type of food that they were eating in lumber camp. And it really allows you to internalize that history and, and make it real for you and give you a, a much deeper understanding of, of uh, what life was like for people in the past. Do you have a favorite outdoor exhibit? 
Um, my favorite outdoor exhibit is probably the birch still, because again, it is quite unique. Uh, the birch still talks about that industry in Pennsylvania. So there are three types, main types of birch trees in PA. The white birch, which is also called paper birch, which has the very characteristic bark that looks like paper. It sort of peels off the tree. The yellow birch, which uh, has, you know, very tight curled bark, sort of like the white birch, only smaller and a more gray color. The wood is more yellow, which is where the, the name comes from. And then the black birch, which is the one that we're interested in with the birch bill. So black birch is sometimes called sweet birch. And just like hemlock bark is very rich in tannins and tannic acid, the bark of the black birch is very rich in a chemical compound called methyl salicylate. And that chemical compound is commonly referred to as spirits of wintergreen. So wintergreen is itself a, a small plant but it has that same chemical, the methyl salicylate. Uh, so anything that was wintergreen flavored, uh, toothpaste, chewing tobacco, mouthwash, all that was derived from uh, the methyl salicylate that was distilled out of the bark of the birch. It is also an analgesic, it's a pain reliever. So it was the main active ingredient in topical pain relief rubs like Bengay and uh, Icy Hot, which you know, did not exist back in the turn of the 20th century, but the same principle. Uh, so again, just like when I talked about chemical wood, if you needed methyl salicylate, distillation of black birch was how you got it around the turn of the 20th century. So again, this is all sort of wrapped up in how the rest of Pennsylvania's lumber industry is progressing. So in the early 20th century, we have already seen a lot of clear cutting happening in different parts of Pennsylvania's landscape. And black birch is a pioneer species. It's one of the first trees that will repopulate in an area that has been, you know, seen a major disturbance to the composition of the forest, like clear cutting would create or a fire or mass erosion or that sort of thing. So there were all these very thick and dense stands of black birch that have sort of cropped up in these clear cut areas. So the people that were running birch stills would build a still near a stand of black birch. They would cut down the saplings. They would bundle them together, load them inside of the still, and essentially pressure cook them for about two days. They'd fill the bottom of the still up with water, build a fire underneath of it. The, it would boil the water. The steam would release the methyl salicylate from the bark and vaporize it. And then it would go into a condenser coil and come out the other side as water and birch oil. And then they would collect the birch oil. Uh, you know, over uh, about two days of running a still, they could produce about a quart of birch oil. And it was sold by weight. So uh, a pound of birch oil uh, was uh, quite lucrative for these, these folks. They could sell it for, you know, $30, $40 a pound in some instances at the height of demand for the, the birch oil. And uh, if you compare the amount of work that they were doing, you know, most wood hicks that were chopping down trees for dimensional lumber were paid about a dollar to a dollar fifty a day around the turn of the 20th century. If you were running a birch still, you could sell a gallon of birch oil at the end of the week for about a hundred dollars. Wow. So, you know, it could be very lucrative and it was very lucrative and it was the way people uh, derived that chemical compound for all the uses that we had for it for any myriad number of things. And again, it is something that is quite unique to the museum. I don't know anywhere else, at least in Pennsylvania, that you can go to and see a functioning birch still and sort of learn about that aspect of Pennsylvania forest products industry. Uh, I take that back. There is one place now. Uh, doTERRA is an essential oil company, and they actually used the still at the museum as a functional model to build their own still. Oh, wow. And they now have a birch distillation facility in Kane, Pennsylvania. So it's kind of one of those things where, you know, old technology is new again. And, you know, as people want to sort of return to uh, more org organically derived and natural sources for things, you know, people want natural foods and whole foods and that sort of thing. Uh, they discovered that if they wanted natural birch oil, they had to make it themselves. So there is, you know, it's nothing like ours still. It's very much modern, but they are doing it in a very natural process based on the functional model. Uh, are still providing. So it's just, I think, you know, from its uniqueness and the fact that we're able to 
operate it and interpret it for folks, let them see the birch oil, smell the birch oil. Our volunteers that um, cook in the kitchen will actually make birch flavored candy, um, use a little bit of the birch oil, and then we can hand that out during demonstrations and people can taste what the, the birch oil tasted like. What is the Bob and Dottie Weber cabin? Bob and Dottie Weber cabin is also one of our newer exhibits that came to the museum under my uh, tenure as the director here. I started in 2015 and the Weber cabin came in 2018. Uh, Bob Weber worked as a forest maintenance supervisor for the Tidotten State Forest. And uh, he and his wife Dottie uh, built a cabin on land that was owned by Bob's father, which is now part of Tidotten State Forest. Uh, it was a, a cabin that's less than 500 square feet altogether. He and her and her brother built it all by hand with trees that were harvested right around the site where the cabin was situated. It uh, had no electricity, no plumbing, no running water. It was about five miles from the nearest paved road. And he and Dottie lived in this cabin for more than 50 years together. So they had this very unique lifestyle. And you might think that folks that lived five miles from a road and didn't have a telephone or electricity but would be relatively isolated, but it was very much the opposite. They were people people. They loved to have visitors and interact with people. Bob loved to tell stories and regale people uh, with his knowledge of the forest and the history of the Pine Creek Valley. Uh, and he also, personally by hand with help of some colleagues and other folks built and maintained over a hundred miles of hiking trails in the uh, Pine Creek Valley during his lifetime. So they were both, uh, they both viewed Pennsylvania's forests as Pennsylvania's greatest natural resource. And they were very much advocates for its wise use and conservation. So they wanted people to get out in the forest and experience all that it had to offer. And, uh, you know, one of the ways that he did that, as I mentioned, was building hiking trails. He also helped to found several of the trail clubs that currently exist in Pennsylvania. They would do group hikes. They would do races. They would do cross-country ski treks. They would do, you know, snowmobile races, those sorts of things. Anything to get people out in the woods and enjoying the forest. And uh, Dottie passed away in 2012 and Bob passed away in 2015. And upon their deaths, it was the same thing. The, the state forest uh, doesn't like abandoned buildings in the state forest. So they wanted to get rid of the cabin. And there were a whole group of people that really loved and appreciated what Bob and Dottie did during their lives. And they came to the museum and advocated that we should preserve the cabin and leave it here and use it as an interpretive exhibit. And uh, it really was a case of us listening to our audience. You know, sometimes it's easy to look back in history and like people like George Washington, who everybody knows, you know, these, these major players in history and, and understand their place in sort of the arc of history and in the importance of the roles they made. When you don't have that distance, you know, when it's only been three years since someone passed away, sometimes it can be hard to put their life and achievements in perspective. But we were definitely listening to the people that said these folks are important and their story needs to be preserved. So there wasn't, you know, between you know, 20, 2015 and 2017, when the project really started to take off, after the idea was floated of moving the cabin here, there wasn't a day that went by that I didn't get an email, a phone call, a letter, somebody stopping in to advocate for uh, the preservation of the Weber cabin. So as I said, it was very much us listening to our audience about what they felt was important. And we moved the cabin here, re-erected it with the help of uh, Tidotten State Forest, Tioga State Forest, and Susquehannock State Forest. They all provided uh, labor and materials and a wealth, uh, you know, a whole slew of volunteers that helped as well. Uh, just like the CCC cabin, everything was numbered as it was before it was disassembled. And it was, you know, a letter number system. So this log is A3, this log is A4, this log is A5. And then everything went back together just the way it came down. Uh, we have several of their possessions inside of the cabin. So we can, again, have people step inside of it and experience what life was like for Bob and Dottie. And then we were fortunate enough that um, Bob took part in an oral history project in the early 2000s. So we actually have about a nine-minute orientation video inside of the cabin as well. 
that lets Bob explain what their life was like in his own words. And then we interviewed a whole slew of people that knew them throughout the course of their life and got their impressions and their stories about, you know, who they were and what they did with their lives and why it was important to remember and uh, acknowledge what they did with this exhibit. So it's, it's a, another fascinating ex part of the uh, outdoor exhibits of the museum. We, you know, talk about their life and their contribution, and then we also sort of frame it. Um, I don't know that they intentionally lived with a very, you know, high conservation ethic, but just the way that they lived was a very much, you know, conservation minded lifestyle. So we have people go into that small cabin and look around at what their life was like and what their possessions were like. And we ask people to sort of look at their own house and their own lifestyle and maybe ask the question, what am I using right now that I might be able to do without to live smaller, conserve more, save more for future generations? Yeah, one of the things I really liked about the exhibit was the fact that maybe that wasn't necessarily why I was going to the Lumber Museum, but I thought it was such a wonderful feature to highlight somebody's lives that made an impact locally. You know, there's, like you said, you know, there's these people that you can talk about the the Roth Rocks that really have this this uh, big shadow that they cast in their, their impact, but it's important to recognize the people that just did small things. I mean, the fact that they took care of so many trails, the fact that they lived purposefully, should be highlighted. And uh, it's one of the things that I stumbled on at the museum that I was really excited for. Yeah, they have a core group of fans. There's a lot of Bob and Dottie Weber <laughs> fans out there. And, you know, to this day, as recently as about two weeks ago, when people show up at the admission desk, a lot of them, the first question out of their mouth is, where is the Weber cabin? How do I get there? Oh, that's great. That's, that's why they're here. That's what they want to see. The museum hosts a number of events throughout the year. Do you have any favorites? Bark Peelers Festival has to be one of my favorites. Uh, that's our biggest event of the year. We always do that when the first full weekend in July. Uh, this this year in 2024, we saw over 2,600 people for the weekend. Wow. So it is, if you don't like crowds, it might not be the best time to visit. But I refer to it as the Disney World experience of the Lumber Museum. You know, if you can, if you can only visit with us once, it's really the best time to visit because it's the most amount of things going on. We have demonstrations taking place all over the site. The mill is running, the birch still is running. We have historic interpreters, uh, you know, providing uh, trade demonstrations, uh, lecture series, uh, Smokey the Bear is here. We have live music, food vendors, craft vendors. It's just, you know, a ton of fun. And probably the highlight of the event is the uh, contest that we have open to the public. So as I mentioned way earlier in our discussion, the Penn York Lumberman's Club saw that the way the lumber industry operated was changing in the 1960s. You don't have a hundred men in the woods swinging axes. Now you have just a handful of people running chainsaws and using heavy equipment. So about that same time, we see the emergence of timber sports, which is sort of taking those old ways and those old tools and instead of using them as a practical purpose to get your work done, sort of turning it into a game and a competition. So we have several uh, timber sports contests that we open to the public as part of Bark Peelers Festival that you can walk in off of the street, sign up, try your hand at using a crosscut saw or rolling a log with a PV. And uh, probably one of the most popular ones is our burling contest that happens on the water of the sawmill pond. You have a floating log with a person on either side and you have to run in place and spin the log and try and be the person that that stays on the log the longest a lot of people show up just for those contests and uh we do you know i, I had mentioned to you prior to us uh, starting the interview we do a beard and mustache competition as part of that we have contests for kids we do a frog jumping competition where you have a frog and it's a, a raceway with four lanes and you can't touch your frog you either have to tap on the board behind it or blow on it or shout encouragement at it to get it to move forward and be the first to jump over the finish line. And we have a sunflower seed spitting contest where you have to spit sunflower seeds into a tub from the furthest distance. That one's also for kids. Josh, how can visitors support the museum and its mission? Well, um, you know, every time you show up and pay admission, that uh, helps to support the museum. 
We are uh, fortunate enough to have the backing of the state of Pennsylvania. So a lot of our costs are subsidized by the taxpayer. So again, I encourage people to come because this is all of our museum. It belongs to everybody. We want to be as as large of a resource as possible for the most number of Pennsylvanians that we can, because we all have a hand in making this happen. Uh, but like I said, just showing up and paying admission helps to support the museum. Uh, we offer a membership program that you can find out about on our website. There is a tab at the top of the web page that talks about becoming a member. So all of your membership dollars go to help support the museum. There's also a way that you can uh, donate to the museum through our website. Um, we do take uh, not only monetary donations, but we are actively collecting as well. So if you are someone who is involved in the modern lumber industry or other things to do with Pennsylvania's forests, if you had a family member that was in the CCC and passed away and perhaps you don't know what to do with their CCC related objects, please contact the museum. We take uh, object donations as well as financial don donations to support our programming and our staffing. Uh, and those object donations help us to tell a better story about Pennsylvania's history in many instances. Those are all things people can do to support the museum. And also, if you're like me and love souvenirs, phenomenal souvenir shop, spend lots of money there. How can I forget? Yeah, we do have a museum gift shop. Uh, the museum, while it is administered by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we exist in partnership with a private nonprofit Friends of the Museum group. So the Friends of the Museum uh, operate the shop and they pay to stock all of the objects in there. And then they also retain the proceeds for the shop. But they hire three of their own staff that help us with visitor services, and all the other experiences that folks have here. And they you know, those special events like Park Pillars Festival, they front all of the money to put those sorts of things on. So purchases at the gift shop, we most definitely support the Friends of the Museum and the museum as a whole. So yeah, check out all the cool stuff they have in there if you visit. Josh, we want to thank you so much for talking to us today. We really appreciate it. I really enjoyed being here. It was a great experience. I thank you for reaching out and asking me to share a little bit about the museum. I want to thank my guest, Josh Roth, for joining the podcast. Be sure to follow us on Instagram and Meta for more information about upcoming episodes. You can support the podcast by buying merch at hemlockstohelpenders.com, or you can click support the show in the podcast description to provide a monthly donation. If you're a Pennsylvania business interested in advertising with the podcast, email us at hemlockstohelpenders at gmail.com. This has been Hemlocks the Hellbenders. I'll see you out there. Hosting, production, and editing by Christian Alexanderson. Music by John Sauer. Graphics by Matt Davis.